Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTank.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. I have a slightly scratchy voice, but it's not because I'm sick, it's quite frankly because I just recorded a really long video. So my voice is a little bit short, but the news never stops, and we have some very interesting stuff to discuss in today's video. I want to start things out with AMD and the second generation of RDNA, because the company have released around a two minute video showing real-time ray tracing running on Narve 2X. Unfortunately, we don't know what the hardware is that they're using for this demo. Now, bear in mind, this actually follows a couple of very interesting things that's happened in the industry. The first, and something else we're going to be discussing today, is DirectX 12 Ultimate, which is kind of an amalgamation of all the new DirectX features, such as DirectX ray tracing, variable rate shading, mesh shaders, and the ability to make you coffee in the morning. So all of those are definite pluses. We'll go into that in just a moment. Some announcements from the Kronos Group regarding ray tracing as well. That's being banked now into their API, which is definitely awesome. Plus, of course, little events in the industry that haven't really caused many waves, like Sony confirming RDNA 2 is part of the PlayStation 5. Indeed, Sony themselves, or Mark Cerny specifically, stated that... Uh, they basically had quite the hand in AMD's roadmap, which was actually something I leaked uh, a couple of days ago. I can't remember exactly how long ago, like three or four days. It all seems to be rolling into one with this whole super fun self-isolation thing. And of course, Microsoft themselves also uh, revealed the Xbox Series X and uh, many of the features. While there are still a lot of questions for the next generation console, at least we have a pretty good handling now on what they will be bringing to the table. Anyway, back to the blog post from AMD. Microsoft and AMD worked closely on the development of DirectX 12 Ultimate feature set to ensure a great experience with AMD RDNA 2 architecture. This is according to Brian Langley, who works at Microsoft. Now, it's worth noting that NVIDIA themselves fully support DirectX 12 Ultimate, but we'll discuss that further in just a moment. So then, this demo. You may actually recognize the video from a slide which AMD showed at their Financial Analyst Day, which at the time was only a static image, but now we have a just under two minute video. Now there is a couple of things that I have to take away from this. One is it looks very visually impressive. I don't actually have my frame rate analysis tools on my laptop, which I'm using to record here. However, I did download the video um, from YouTube and I threw it into Adobe Premiere with a 60 FPS uh, frame rate on the video. And I started to manually scrub through it. Yes, um, one of those people. Uh, despite the fact that the video itself was uh, running at 60 FPS on YouTube, the actual frame rate of the video seems to have been encoded at 30 FPS, which means, of course, you're getting duplicate frames anyway. But uh, scrubbing through the video, uh, rather manually playing it one frame at a time, kind of one, two with the right arrow key, you could quite easily see that there was more than uh, one duplicate frame every other frame. So basically, if it's 60 FPS, obviously there'd be no duplicate frames if it was consistent. It'd be like fresh frame, fresh frame, fresh frame, fresh frame. If it was a 60 FPS video that had been um, recoded to 30 FPS, you would see a duplicate frame. So it'd be like new frame, duplicate frame, new frame, duplicate frame, new frame, duplicate frame. I'll stop there before you go insane. But with this, I noted that there was quite a few repeated frames during the run. And also, um, it wasn't just that the frame rate was kind of up and down. It looked like there was some pacing stuff as well. Uh, but I'm saying that without my frame rate tools running. So I can't give you an exact frame rate. But you can probably kind of do much the same yourself if you really wanted to. Either way, I would point out that A, we don't know the state of the drivers. B, we don't know the state of the hardware. C, this is not final release. And D, 
well, this does not look easy to run. This looks a pretty damn complicated scene. Just look at the ray tracing reflections in the water and the various surfaces. There is a lot of bounces there. So this is certainly not like, let's just say cheap to run on the GPU. This is probably eating a lot of, a lot of performance up on the GPU. But either way, uh, it's very cool that we've got this demo. For those that have been DMing me regarding my opinions of RDNA 2, I am working on a video for that. Currently I'm working on a ray tracing video which has just really exploded in how big I was originally intending the scope of the project to be. But now, the, and also to be honest, I was kind of waiting for the official announcements for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox, and now that they've kind of appeared and we know what the state of the hardware is i feel much more comfortable actually releasing the video and not knowing that i'm giving you all a load of crap um so the good news is that's actually the audio i was working on today so i'm working on that but i am also working on a lot of stuff for the next generation consoles but this the great thing is it really does tie in to rdna2 as well so hopefully over the next couple of days i'll finish off a lot of scripts um juggling a lot of plates at the moment so i will be going into a lot of rdna2 stuff because now i have a pretty good understanding of what is being changed for the architecture so uh definitely stick with me if you do want that information anywho uh moving from pushing you to uh, click the subscribe button to microsoft because the company have just announced DirectX 12 Ultimate. Amusingly, the website videocards.com actually uh, posted an image of it just prior to the official announcement with DirectX Ultimate, and you can see that NVIDIA were actually pushing the fact that Turing is totally and utterly compliant. So I'll say right off the bat, some of these features, like, you know, ray tracing, uh, they will not be applicable if you have certain GPUs. So, for example, if you've got Pascal, if you've bought, I don't know, a 5700 uh, graphics card from uh, AMD, you will not be able to run some of these features. Truthfully, there is an awful lot here in the blog post, which, of course, will be linked in the video description, uh, well outside the realms of what I could cover extensively in a news video. But many of the things that Microsoft have previously, previously excuse me, announced are once again reinforced here. So we see DirectX uh, R 1.1, which is, uh, as Microsoft themselves say, an incremental addition over the DXR 1.0 capability. So there are several new capabilities, but essentially three major ones are implemented. The first is GPU work creation. Uh, for ray, ray tracing. So basically the GPU itself, its shaders can actually run ray tracing without needing to request the CPU to do anything for it. So this is really good for basically culling work and it just essentially means that the CPU doesn't need to be brought into the equation which can reduce latency and it just means things are snappier. Streaming engines are also there which can load new ray tracing shaders uh, depending on what's actually happening in the game world, which is obviously now that we're seeing vastly larger worlds with the next generation of games. Um, and I don't just mean larger in terms of actual physical dimensions either. I mean a lot deeper, with a lot more objects, a lot more geometry, a lot better just quality overall of visual uh, differences. So this is all going to be quite important. And also we see inline ray tracing, which is a form of ray tracing, which gives developers options to uh, push uh, ray tracing as a more dynamic process. I've discussed variable ray shading on this channel, probably ad nauseum at this point. But the, the gist is that if you are rendering a scene, all of the scene does not need to necessarily be rendered at the same visual quality. So, for example, if an object is being blurred because it's, like, zooming past you, just for example, you're kind of, like, on a city street and a car is, like, zooming past you at high speed, it doesn't really need to be drawn in complete and utter fine detail. It can kind of approximate it a little bit because, obviously, you've got motion blur associated with it. And also, things in your peripheral vision are not necessarily so important to render a high detail. So what instead you can do is crank down details on those objects and crank up details on things that are in your peripheral vision. So for example, let's say you're playing an FPS and you're kind of looking at a specific enemy and trying to, you know, stop it from like eating your face. 
you probably care a lot less about the trees that are all the way in the background that are being partially obscured by sprays of blood anyway. Let's just be honest. Um, NVIDIA, to their credit, really pushed variable rate shading and also the next thing, mesh shaders first. So mesh shaders, they are actually quite a significant difference in how the GPU's rendering pipeline will function. And I wouldn't quite say they're as big of a leap as what we saw with, let's say, when we has, uh, when we had, excuse me, a fixed function to uh, unified uh, rendering pipeline. But essentially here now, mesh shading makes geometry act more like a compute shader. And this actually has some significant benefits, particularly when it comes to culling of objects in the uh, in the rendering pipeline. I actually discussed this quite extensively with uh, Neil Trevitt, who is both one of the seniors over at NVIDIA and also the Kronos Group. I actually had an interview with him, and we actually discussed this extensively, albeit for the function of, uh, of uh, Vulcan. So... It's very similar though, so you can check that uh, out if you would like. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. And we also see sampler feedback as well. So sampler feedback is not really something that an end user, unless you're a game developer of course, is probably going to be that impacted by. So if you are a game developer, you'll be very pleased to know that it's going to allow you to optimize and analyze how resources are used for a specific game. Also, I'd like to touch on some of the cool stuff with Kronos Group and its uh, Vulkan ray tracing extensions. So overall, you can pretty much say that there's a great deal of parity between DirectX tier 1.1 ray tracing capabilities and also Vulkan. Indeed, you can argue the same thing for much of Vulkan and DirectX 12. Honestly, the two APIs are extremely capable, and there's not a huge difference between them. And of course, it does depend mostly on drivers of this situation in, in this uh, particular instance. With Nvidia doing very well, it must be said on Vulcan. Anyway, uh, there are some very interesting things here in this uh, graph where you can see Vulcan ray tracing and DXR. You can see what is actually optional and what isn't. So. One of the very interesting things about Vulkan is that if you have a large number of CPU cores, uh, let's face it, a lot of uh, games now have like six CPU cores minimum, but quite frequently we'll have an eight core processor like a 3700X or a 9900K or whatever, or maybe you've even got like a 3950 in your machine, or perhaps even more if you've got like high-end uh, desktop system. So essentially a lot of the time with games, the cores are basically just doing nothing. Um, but what can happen here is if the GPU is fully loaded, as you can imagine it quite frequently is with games, some of those CPU cores can actually have some of the work put onto them. So in other words, the CPU can actually help with ray tracing. Of course, how well this actually works in terms of performance, I don't know yet because we've not really seen any games which or benchmarks we can which can kind of show this off. But it is a fascinating concept. And now since we've spoken about every single company ever, we might as well throw in a small NVIDIA rumour. I would stress that this is up in the air, so if it turns out to be a load of rubbish, well, yeah. Uh, but a couple of users have been pretty consistent in uh, leaking Ampere information and of course we say Ampere because we don't actually know when NVIDIA are going to call the next generation of cards officially. Apparently internally the working name is Ampere but when it finally gets launched it could be called Owl or uh, you know Coffee Strain or something we honestly just don't know. Apparently Hopper is not the next generation that's what I'm hearing anyway it is the generation after that and will most likely be built on the 5nm process anyway getting back to this information according to two different sources one is uh, Kapiti Sivan Kimi and the other one is Corgi Kitty the next generation cards for the RTX 30 series will have an RTX 3090 though of course the name can change at literally the last minute 
with a core which is slightly cut down based on GA102, and this is going to feature 4,992 CUDA cores. Furthermore, a, a couple of people now are stating that all NVIDIA cards for the next generation will have ray tracing with drastically increased performance compared to what we have with RTX 20. And the last thing is apparently all of the cards will have uh, 18 GBPS memory, which kind of makes sense because even if you're purchasing a lower end card, if the performance is higher, you're still going to need lots of additional bandwidth to be able to feed the monster. And I don't think in the video I can drastically increase the amount of RAM on the next generation GPUs. That's also a rumor that's been floating around. Uh, that, for example, the RTX 3080 Ti or the 3090 or whatever it's called will probably only have like 12 gigs of RAM. And quite frankly, I'm probably suspecting that this is going to be the case. Uh, I think the next generation cards are also going to benefit quite heavily with PCIe 4. I think that texture swapping is going to be quite important. I also um, believe that PC games are going to definitely be impacted by the way SSDs are so ingrained into the next generation consoles as well. With all of that said though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.